Um, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me back. Um, okay, so the title of my talk today is There's Never Been a More Exciting Time to Be a Developer. Um, but first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm Jake, as you all heard, Jake McMullen. Um, I'm one of the uh, founders of Stripey Sock. Um, apologies for the gratuitous use of uh, animations there. I'm told that it's actually tradition that we need an anvil presentation in every Dev World talk. So done. Um, so Stripey Sock, uh, we're an app development company um, based in Canberra. Um, so just a slight disclaimer at the start, then I just have to give you a sort of content advisory. Um, this presentation may contain um, mild political references, but I'll try and keep them to a minimum. Um, some of you may have uh, used some of, our, some of our apps before, um, particularly if you're between the age of three and five. Or if you know someone between the age of three and five, you might have uh, seen Kids Eye View, which was one of the apps we, we worked on for the ABC. Um, but enough about me and Stripey Sock. Um, what I wanted to talk about today before we begin was just to sort of mark the occasion. So um, we all know there's a, there's a few birthdays happening uh, at the moment. We all know this is the 10th anniversary of this conference. Uh, so happy birthday, Dev World. Um, <laughs> Happy birthday, Dev World. Um, it's also, this year, is the 10th anniversary uh, of the iPhone's launch. So happy birthday, uh, iPhone, as well. Um, and it's, oop, got to go back. That guy's birthday on Friday. So happy birthday, Henry. Um, so I thought 10 years, what better excuse for a little bit of nostalgia? Um, you know, opportunity to sort of reflect on the past 10 years what's happened in that time, how we've all changed, how the landscapes have changed, where we're at today, and where we might be headed in the future. Um, 10 years is a, feels like a really long time ago for me. I don't know how many of you can sort of remember 10 years ago. For example, uh, can you remember what phone you were using 10 years ago before the iPhone? 3310. Nokia 3310, awesome. Um, this, this is the one I was using. It was a smartphone. Um, a handspring uh, trio, um, and I remember at the time I was so excited that I could customize my phone and put stuff on it. So uh, I rushed out and the first app I installed was something that would let me change the ringtone and I could choose any MP3 that would play. This was back when polyphonic ringtones was the selling feature point of feature phones, and I could have one that could play actual music. And I was really into the West Wing at the time, so I made uh, the West Wing theme song play every time my phone rang. But unfortunately it also caused the phone to crash. So the phone would ring, I'd hear the West Wing, it'd crash, I'd reboot it, and then I'd get a missed call from whoever was trying to get through. Um, so things have changed a little bit since then. Um, of course, uh, not long after um, I had that phone, um, the handspring, this is the first iOS device I had, I think. If I've got the right picture, yes, it is an iPod. Uh, so I didn't get the first iPhone. Um, I was uh, traveling at the time, living in the UK when the iPhone was launched, um, but about to move back to Australia. Um, so I went out and got the first iPod Touch that came out. So I think this was uh, around September 2007, the iPod Touch was released. Um, went and bought it, and as soon as I'd used it, I knew this was, this was huge. This was going to change things. It was going to change things for me personally, and it was going to change things for the industry I worked in. Um, and so I, I remember it really well because I was traveling at the time. Um, I was actually staying in um, a little hilltop town in uh, Tuscany in Italy um, later that year. And it was actually the year um, of a big election in Australia, um, 2007. Uh, and I remember using my iPod Touch and trying to find a bar, found a bar in a little street that had free Wi-Fi, went into the bar to, on my iPod Touch, look at who had won the election. And it turned out to be uh, this guy. Things change, don't they? Um, but nostalgia, right? So it's an excuse for nostalgia. And of course, nostalgia is meant to be this thing where we all reflect on the past. <laughs> Think about the good old days, you know, when we all wore baggy pants and listened to grungy musicians complain about the world and how everything was better then, right? Um, well, actually, no. That's, that's, if you haven't guessed from the title of my presentation, um, that's not my, what I'm going to say. I actually think everything is better now. I mean, for example, um, we have bikes, we have skinny jeans instead of baggy jeans. We've got bikes and beards and uh, bespoke toast. 
Uh, and instead of having to listen to grungy musicians, we get a seer. So clearly everything's much better. Um, in fact, I put it to you that there has in fact never been a more exciting time to be an Austra sorry, wrong slide, to be a developer. Um, so why, why do I think this is the case? Uh, basically three reasons. I think that um, technology is more ubiquitous now than it has been at any time in history. We have more access to more devices and we make better use of them than ever before. Technology is better than it's ever been. So it's more present and all of the devices we have are getting better as well. And I also think it's easier than ever to take advantage of that technology, particularly as developers. So what do I mean by this? Let's start with ubiquity. Um, here's a chart from Akamai. They do a state of the internet report every year and they've done one since, I think this one goes back to 2009. Um, and in Akamai's State of the Internet report, they, one of the, the figures they report on is the number of unique IPv4 addresses they see on their content delivery network. And as you can see in 2009, hey, laser pointer, uh, it was, what, around 300 million unique devices? And it's just gone steadily up and up until uh, about 2015 when it's approaching 800 million, 850 million uh, unique IP addresses. Um, you might be wondering what's happened here. Have we actually suddenly stopped getting more devices? No, we're running out of IPv4 addresses. Um, so we've started to see the switch to IPv6 and also our large scale, like whole country wide network address translation. Um, so Akamai are, seeing, are not seeing a growth in unique IPv4 addresses anymore. Um, Another way to look at it is uh, Cisco said in their Zettabyte era report that um, we're on track to have uh, more than three times the number of devices than the global population by 2021, which is only a few years away, really. Um, and here's actually a statistic from Google's, um, they do some analysis of consumer use of technology. Um, and here's the number of devices per person uh, over, over time. So you see in 2012 we had roughly two devices per person and now up to 2016 uh, there's a little over three devices per person. Um, this is internet connected devices uh, unless of course you're Jake and I have six. Um, I reckon there's probably someone here that can beat six. Uh, so I actually have some prizes here to give out. Who has, uh, maybe we should limit it to do we, no, let's do the number of internet connected devices you as an individual sort of are responsible for in your household. Uh, do we have anyone with 10? Someone with 10? Anyone with 11? You've got to be able to list them to claim the prize. 20? We've got 20 at the back. 50 internet connected devices. Okay, you win the prize. Uh, do you want freckles or caramel chucks? I can't throw that far, by the way. Um, I've also got a prize for who's got the least. Is there anyone that's got no internet connected devices? Um, anyone have one internet connected device? Does anyone have less than the average, which is 3.2? Yay, you win the next prize. <laughs> this is behind you. Oh, you, oh, you can share it with the two of you. Um, so that's a bit of fun, but a serious statistic there that, you know, th these devices are becoming much more ubiquitous. Um, but I think sometimes charts and numbers are a little bit dry. What does that actually mean to us as developers, this proliferation of devices? Uh, so here's another chart, um, after saying they're a bit dry, but this one has pictures. Um, this is the devices that uh, I've, at Stripey Sock, we've written code to run on or me as a developer starting in 2007 before I founded Stripey Sock. So uh, 2007, I was largely working on a single platform, like the web, on desktop, laptop. Um, 2008, I uh, started building the first iPhone app that I was working on, so suddenly had sort of another device to think about. Um, 2010, iPad came out and was quickly, you know, adopted that and started thinking about what we could do there. Um, 2016, so I've skipped a few years here. I uh, also had the Apple TV, the Apple Watch, um, an FTPOS terminal. Um, I, think, I think Combank's one of the sponsors here. Hello, Combank, Albert. Um, 
2017 this year, uh, all of those plus uh, Amazon Echo and a uh, connected TV. So this is just sort of in, in my development career, how things have changed in that time. Um, that now there are so many more platforms on which I can write code and have an opportunity to make a difference to people. Um, I just pull out a couple of them because had you asked me 10 years ago where my code would be running, these are the ones that probably surprised me the most. So this is Combank's uh, Albert FPOS terminal. The idea that you can actually run apps on an FPOS terminal seems kind of a bit crazy, but um, it basically runs Android. We did an app uh, to sell tickets for um, C-Link and Captain Cook cruises. So uh, replaced previously their ticket sales was um, a, an old school FPOS terminal, um, coins and, and notes, whatnot, and also have the person would have to carry around a ticket printer and um, you know, interact with a point of sale system. So they were having to carry around lots of things. And then we did this app for them and now they've got a single device that they can do the ticketing on, print the tickets and do the payment. Um, another one that I found kind of interesting is I've got an Amazon Echo, um, just made a simple app for it so I can uh, walk into my kitchen in the morning and ask it to play ABC radio and I get to hear Fran Kelly come on. Um, so that's just sort of a, an example of how computing and technology is becoming more ubiquitous. It's uh, more in every area of our lives and I think that trend's only set to continue. Um, but how is it getting better? Because I said it was also getting better too. Well, I think this one potentially is quite obvious. Um, this is the first computer in Australia, uh, CIRAC, uh, developed by CSIRO. It's actually um, housed at Melbourne Museum, which is not far from here. Um, it's actually also, I think, the fifth uh, stored program computer in the world. Um, and it was huge, the size of a room. Um, the compute power, not particularly huge. Uh, I think it was developed in about 1949. Um, so, how have things changed since then? Well, you've probably all heard of Moore's Law, the idea where um, the number of transistors you can fit on a, a circuit sort of doubles in roughly every 18 months. Um, there's a, a corollary to that, which is um, Bell's Law, which basically says that every dec decade or so, the improvements in computing technology will mean that we'll have a new class of device, something that will be dramatically smaller, cheaper, and better than what came before, and will therefore enable a whole range of new app applications, uh, new uses. Um, and I think this has kind of held true. So we've got basically starting in the 1960s mainframes that filled the size of a room. Um, then about in the 1970s, we've got mini computers that are about the size of a fridge and the cost of a house. Um, then we went to workstations in the 80s that were, you know, you could actually put on a desk and were about the cost of a car. Um, then we saw personal computers introduced in the late 80s, early 90s, um, bringing the cost down and the, the size even smaller. Um, laptops after that, smartphones, and now uh, we've actually got, oh, sorry, I forgot I had this slide in here. Just again, reflecting on my career, how, what, what different platforms I've been involved with. Interestingly, the very first computer I worked on was a mainframe. Um, it wasn't Cyrac. I'm not that old, uh, but it was an IBM Z100. Uh, it disturbs me that that was running back then. It probably is still running now. Um, but yeah, so now where are we at? We've got these tiny computers the size of a grain of rice. Uh, so this thing is, um, sorry, I've hidden my presenter notes so I can't actually see it. Um, I think it's from MIT and it's called a micro moat. Um, there were definitely three M's, M cubed. Uh, and it's the size of a grain of rice. Um, it's not just a, a processor. So I've seen kind of very, very miniature CPUs before. This thing is a computer. It's got power. It's got I.O. It's got a radio so that it can transmit wirelessly. Uh, and it's got a CPU. Um, it's so small that it can be injected into the body and then take sensor readings and transmit them through the skin to a reader on the outside. Um, and that is, exists today. That's kind of nuts. Um, but I guess more practically, what does this mean in our sort of day-to-day -day lives? Um, we're starting to get small sort of consumer devices like the Intel NUC uh, and the Intel Compute Stick. So the Compute Stick, if you haven't seen it, is like a HDMI um, thing. You just plug it into the HDMI port and it runs Windows 10. It is a computer. Um, it's kind of crazy how small they're getting and what that might mean for where computers can be used where they maybe previously couldn't. Um, so 
yeah, devices are getting much better. The capabilities, the compute power is getting much better. And what this means uh, for us, just one example of how we've used this, we built an app for the um, National Portrait Gallery in Canberra where visitors to the gallery can use their phones to hold it up to a portrait um, and we're running on-device image recognition to detect what portrait they're looking at and show them more information about that portrait and that wouldn't have been possible a few years ago when the compute power of you know, mobile devices wasn't up to that sort of um, comparisons. So talked about sort of the scale of computers, the size, uh, the CPU performance. That's not the only way in which these devices are getting better. They're getting better in almost every way. So screen resolutions are getting higher resolution. Um, color reproduction is getting better. They're getting lighter. Um, we're getting more sensors like gyroscopes, barometers, cameras, compasses, um, getting things like Bluetooth uh, low energy, which is enabling a lot more. So our, our technology is improving in a number of ways all of the time. And then finally, um, I think it's easier than ever before to make use of this technology. Um, so again, reflecting on sort of my own career in the, in the past decade, um, I think in about 2007, maybe this is 2006, uh, I started working at um, CSIRO as doing some web development. Um, this was the server we were using at the time when I arrived. There was a, a Power Mac G4, um, and it was my responsibility to set it up, install the operating system. Uh, I had to back it up, which kind of freaked me out because I'm not very good at remembering to do things. I always felt anxious that I had I remembered to change the tapes because it was backed up to tape, the tape drive. Um, and before I could do any development work on it, I had to install the OS, I had to install web objects because of course it's the best development environment ever. Um, and then, only then after doing all of that work could I actually get started writing code. Um, it seems crazy because these days we've got uh, we're spoiled for choice when it comes to sort of cloud computing platforms. I've got Amazon Web Services, Microsoft's Azure, IBM have one called Bluemix, Google Cloud Platform, and of course, let's not forget iCloud. Um, as places we can run code in the cloud without actually having to do any setup at all. We can go straight from thinking of something to implementing it without having to worry about all of that other infrastructure. Um, we've started using this. Uh, in particular, I've used a framework serverless. Has anyone used this one? couple of people, yeah. Uh, it's pretty cool. So serverless seeks to abstract the cloud computing backend from you. Uh, it's a command line utility that you can use. You configure it with a YAML file to describe the stack you want to create, uh, and then it does that for you. So here's an example of a script running uh, to do, um, you know, just change into a directory where I've got a YAML file describing a, a stack that I want, where I want a simple function uh, that can run uh, Via, you know, when I hit it via HTTP and return something. So you just change into the directory, type serverless, deploy, and it goes ahead and from that configuration creates all of the cloud infrastructure you need. Um, and it can be non-trivial. So we've got examples where it's created, um, so Lambda functions uh, with writing to DynamoDB, which is a document database with an API gateway front end that allows you to configure how clients interact with it, with, it, with an auth provider to make sure that you can only hit the API if you're authenticated, and it will create that full stack for you. Um, set it up with continuous integration, so when we are working in a feature branch, we'll, it'll create a full stack of everything that we need, uh, sort of isolated in that, to that feature branch, um, and then when it's finished, you get a URL, and you can just open up web browser and hit it. So you can basically go from what used to take days or weeks to get your server up and off the ground and running, it can take seconds. Um, it supports both. Uh, it supports a bunch of uh, cloud providers: AWS, I, IBM, um, Google Cloud Code as well. Um, so that's just one example of how I think the the um, quality of the software services and the infrastructure that's available to us just keeps improving. Um, I think we heard a presentation earlier in the week or yesterday about the, the number of sort of. Um, machine learning algorithms that are available uh, via the cloud. We've used a bunch of that sort of stuff as well. Um, computer vision. Uh, it's amazing how, how much computing power is available and packaged in a way that's really easy to start using. So you can basically go from having an idea about something to an implementation of a prototype running you know, that afternoon where it's doing something quite non-trivial. Um, and what this means for development is you've got a much quicker feedback loop in terms of thinking of thinking up an idea, 
getting an implementation off the ground, trying it out, seeing if it actually works. So a great example of one that we tried for the portrait gallery, turned out it didn't work, um, but we got to that understanding really quickly, um, was Amazon's got a facial recognition service. So you can give it a face um, and it will tell you if it's a face that it knows about, um, it'll tell you which face it is. So you can uh, train it with images of people you'd like it to be able to recognize and then show it a different image of that person and it'll come back and tell you which, which person it is. And so we thought um, something we could build for the portrait gallery is a kind of which portrait am I most like? So you could take a selfie and submit it to Amazon's facial recognition and it would go through their sort of 3,000 portraits and tell you which one was the closest match. Unfortunately, it's too good in that it didn't have any false positives, <laughs> which was kind of boring. You'd walk in and say, no, you don't look like anyone. <laughs> the only time I could trick it was when I showed it a picture of Justin Bieber and Elvis and then it did do a false positive. Uh, but I had to find two images that people had kind of selected that looked very close. Um, so just recapping, um, my argument is that there's never been a more exciting time to be a developer because, um, because computing is more ubiquitous than it's ever been before. More people have more devices and use them more, giving us as developers the greatest opportunity we've ever had to make a difference to those people. Uh, it used to be we could write code and it would run on one device somewhere and it might be occasionally used by one person. Now we're in a situation where we can write code and potentially it could run on millions of devices worldwide um, used frequently throughout the day by all of those people. And that gives us an opportunity to make a real difference to people's lives. Um, technology is better than it's ever been. We've got a huge range of tools at our disposal to work with. Better hardware, better software that's much easier to integrate and use. Um, so finally, I'd just like to finish with an example of how all of these things have sort of come together for us at Stripey so just one of the apps we've worked on. Um, this is an app we've built for the National Portrait Gallery again. So we're their digital partner. Um, we sort of get to work with them on a whole heap of ideas throughout the year. We get to sort of propose new things and they're usually pretty keen to, to try it out. Um, so one, one problem that they had was often um, schools that come to Canberra will visit the Portrait Gallery and if they've made arrangements beforehand, um, the gallery staff will meet them and run a sort of a guided tour, a, a program, uh, interactive workshop with staff facilitating. Um, however, there are lots of schools that uh, don't make bookings beforehand and just arrive and there'll be 30 or 50 students come off a bus and want to spend some time in the gallery. So they need an activity that those groups can do that doesn't involve the gallery staff. And so we built um, an app for them to give to, to students while they're visiting to sort of facilitate their visit to the gallery. Uh, and the way the app works is the children are given iPads, the teacher's given an iPad, and the children are asked to divide into groups of about two or three, with one iPad between the two or three of them. Um, and there might be, say, three teachers supervising 60 students. So we'll sort of ask each of the teachers to look after two or three of the groups of students uh, so they can sort of supervise them uh, during their visit. Um, so one of the first things we need to do is figure out how to associate uh, a teacher with the two or three groups that they're supervising. Um, and so we're using iPads and we thought, why not use our Bluetooth Low Energy, turn one of the iPads into an iBeacon temporarily, um, make the student tap their iPad, come to close proximity to it uh, to trigger that association and link the two together. Um, so there's this tap to begin and it pairs the student's iPad with the corresponding teachers. Um, the next thing the students see is a map where they're um, sent randomly to some gallery uh, in a gallery space within the, the wider gallery. Um, and so how do the kids know where they are and where they're going? Well, we've got eye beacons in each of the gallery spaces so the iPad can know which gallery space it's in by the beacon that has the strongest signal. So they look at this map and it lights up to show them which space they're in and where they need to navigate to. Um, when they get there, again, we're using this natural image recognition on device, so they're asked to choose a portrait that they want to sort of reflect upon and, and talk a little bit about. And once they've chosen, they hold their iPad up to the portrait and it recognises which portrait they're looking at and it pulls back some information about that portrait to say, oh, you've chosen this portrait of Princess Mary. Um, meanwhile, the teacher on their iPad app is getting real-time updates. So they'll see, this is listed, the group screen listing the sort of four groups this teacher's supervising. And they'll see ahead of time which two gallery spaces each group's going to be sent to. Uh, 
as the groups move around into a gallery, the teacher will see which gallery space they're currently in. So they can sort of look and go, hang on, they're meant to be going to gallery three. Why have they been off in gallery two for so long? Um, when the student chooses a portrait, uh, the teacher gets to sort of see which portrait was chosen. Um, they can then tap on that portrait to get more information about it. So it gives the, this is something sort of we observed. Um, over time, we built this sort of iteratively. We would build a version, give it to the gallery, go and watch it in use, and then think about how we could potentially improve it. And something that we saw was um, the students were going off and doing their thing and then coming back at the end, and the teachers were not very well prepared to talk to the students about what had happened. They were sort of on the spot. Um, and we thought, oh, if there was a companion app for the teacher, then whilst the students are sort of selecting portraits, the teacher could be doing a little bit of thinking about, OK, well, what am I going to ask these kids about why they chose that portrait? Who is that person? <laughs> you know, because they might not know everyone. Um, they can read up on the history and be a, in a better position to facilitate a conversation about it when the kids get back. Um, also in the teacher app, the teachers can send messages to the students. Um, we originally envisaged this as a feature that would allow teachers to sort of say, OK, time to wrap up, let's meet at a particular location. Um, but it turns out that both teachers and students love this feature. They just use it the whole time to message the teachers just telling the students. And we were soliciting feedback from students at the end saying, what was the best bit? And they are saying, oh, I loved it when my teacher was telling me off remotely through the app. Like, <laughs> OK, we'll put more of that in. Uh, and in fact, we did put more of that in. We've also given now the gallery staff a little iPhone app that allows them to do the same messaging. So a teacher can send a message to the students that they're supervising. A gallery staff member can send a message to all students. So if, for example, they need to say, please stop running, you know, they can send a message. Um, and then finally, the, at the end, it sort of brings together all the information that the students collated. So it includes uh, uh, comments the students have made by typing text, but also includes audio they recorded using the microphone on the iPad and photos they've taken of details in the portrait that interested them. So to think about creating this just a few years ago, it would have been, I don't know, I, I would have felt this is a huge project. There's a lot in it. Um, but we were able to do this pretty quickly uh, by building on the capabilities of the hardware, the capabilities of the software, and the internet services. So we're using um, CloudKit for the communication between the iPads. So sending push notifications back and forth, and we didn't even have to set up you know, like proper provisioning profiles with push enabled, because when you use CloudKit, it just does that for you. Um, you know, so yeah, the fact that there is no back end, we didn't have to set it up, um, enabled us to sort of prototype something really, really quickly. Uh, it turns out that student, uh, teachers want to be able to take this content back when they return to whichever city they'd come from um, to share with the families of the students. So we ended up uh, sticking something up on Amazon's web services as well, where at the end the teacher can publish the set of tours and it goes into an S3 bucket and uses Amazon's simple email service to send an email then to the teacher with a link to where they can go and view this material on the web as well. Um, so that's just a, a little bit of an example of how we've sort of benefited from this increase in uh, the ease of using this, this technology. Um, and one of the reasons, I guess, I think it's never been a more exciting time to be a developer. Um, so on that note, I just guess I'd like to finish with a slide um, talking a bit about the fact that I think because we're living in this time when it's never been easier to create technology and it's never been more pervasive, I also think it's sort of, it, we've got a little bit of a responsibility to, to use that power wisely. So I think, you know, we should uh, take advantage of these opportunities to make things better uh, where we can. Um, and as an example of that, here's uh, an app a friend of mine made over the weekend for his, uh, his kid, which I think takes advantage of a lot of this um, and lets him control the light in his bedroom. So he's got an iPad and he can change the color. <laughs> so you can see why I think it's never been a more exciting time to be a developer or um, a toddler who has a dad as a developer. <laughs> Thank you.